Sorry, I think it just a giant bird just flew into my window. Sorry about that. I just sounded like a plane crashed. Angry birds. Oh, God. Well, I'm going to have to clean that up. Welcome back to the Ball Nine Roundhouse. I am your host, Chris Vitale, and we are joined today by a great panel. I'm going to start with our first time guest, the one and only radio voice of the New York Mets, Howie Rose. How are you doing today, Howie? I'm all right. How are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. Good to see you. And now back to our returning guests, uh, the one and only Kevin Kernan, America's most beloved sports writers, here with us as usual. How are you doing, brother? Doing good. And uh, Howie, I, I love your plaque behind you, and I have mine behind me. Yes, congratulations. You too, buddy. It was fun. That's a nice event they put on. And of course, we're talking about the New York State Hall of Fame, and it is a great event and uh, highly recommended. It's, it's a great time. And actually, my, who I went with last time to see you get inducted, Kevin, Rocco Constantino, Mets fan and our ombudsman, is back with us as usual. How are you doing? Doing great. I don't have any plaques behind me, but I got a... Uh... Willie Mays bobblehead that looks like Louis Armstrong that uh, Mr. Vitale gave me one day. It really does look like Louis Armstrong. It's weird. And last but not least, I believe this is your third time on the show. Our buddy Glendon Rush is here, our favorite lefty. How you doing, brother? I'm good. Good to be here. Good to see you guys. Um, I have a Cubs jersey, which I won, I believe, maybe six games for one year. And, uh, and a... Uh, and that's World Series jersey behind me. So no plaques, though. But, yeah, good to be back. I uh, love chatting baseball with you guys. Excellent. Well, we're going to jump right in because there might not be much going on in the world of baseball with lockout 2021 going on. But uh, you wouldn't know it if you're a Mets fan. So we're going to go talk about what's going on in Queens because uh, Steve Cohen and Billy Epler are making quite the splash even during the lockout. Um, we're going to start with. Well, the, the latest bit of news that the Mets finally got a manager and one with some experience. Buck Showalter is taking the helm. Um, and Howie, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Obviously, you know, you're, you're going to be calling these games. So, well, uh, you know, Chris, I, I endorsed the idea of Buck from the very beginning of the process, if for no other reason that it was as much of a slam dunk, no brainer as they've ever been presented with. Um, he checked just about every box, if not, in fact, every box. It's a team that Steve Cohen has invested a great deal of money into and is now you know, really largely a veteran club. And with the failures, relatively speaking, of a few of the previous hires, really two, the third being Carlos Beltran, who never did get out of the starter's gate, of managers who were not experienced and did, in fact, show quite a few growing pains along the way. They could not afford to take a chance. However, wonderful a manager, Mac Bertaro and or Joe Espada might become someday. The Mets could not afford to take that chance. Buck Showalter was the easiest decision Steve Cohen might ever have to make as Mets owner. I agree. And now, Kevin, I know you, you've written about this. You know, you said the Mets kind of needed a, an adult in the room and now they have one and, you know, you fully endorse Buck as well. And, you know, I mean, I'm a Yankee fan and, you know, I, I miss Buck. I mean, believe me, I was kind of hoping he would show up in the Bronx, but, you know, it's say la vie. So, Kevin, you know, your thoughts on Buck? Yeah, a couple of quick things. Uh, Buck, Buck knows talent. That helps. And Buck knows everything. And that helps, too. Now, he can over he can overwear you a little bit as a human being, but it, that usually takes three, four years. It's going to be very important. And this is why I think it's key for Buck. Um, he knows the game so well. He will have the players prepared. This is a guy, I was talking to somebody he worked with in Texas. They would have meetings at 7 a.m. every morning with a, uh, back then, index cards, you know, of what they were doing exactly fundamentally at what time, you know, everything you could imagine. The Mets have not had that kind of leadership um, uh, un unfortunately, they've had managers who've looked the other way because they've been influenced by the nerds. The nerds want to run the show. Buck will work with the nerds, but he will not let be a master of the nerds. And that's that's huge because he already had, you know, he's, he's, you know, this is the thing, Chris, real quick. But they, they forget the nerds forget that a lot of these managers are really into math and, and numbers. And it, it, that's the game they, they knew the whole way. They just don't express it in, in nerd terms. 
but they know all that stuff. I go all the way back to Jack McKean, big Wall Street guy, you always playing with numbers. On, 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 they understand numbers, but they also understand the heart, the gut, the, and that. And Buck, and one final point on Buck before we move on. I like it because Francisco Lindor thought he was the manager last year. He thought he was the GM. I know for a fact that before they made the trade for Baez, before that GM that was there for a while, little while, made the trade, he actually went down in batting practice and and told Lindor first. Lindor gave him a big hug. Then they announced the trade. So this Buck has the ability to keep Lindor in line, but he also has the intelligence to think, uh, to keep Lindor thinking that he's actually running the team, Lindor, when he's not. So I think this is going to be a big thing for Lindor because Lindor can worry about playing baseball and not worry about being in charge of the whole team and every aspect and thumbs down, you know, and all the other garbage and the fight, the terrible fight. And that was a terrible fight with McNeil. I really feel bad for McNeil what happened. I had heard that if not for Luis Guillaume coming out of the clubhouse, like this could have been a lot worse. He kind of ran into it and stopped it before it got even worse. So Buck, uh, Buck will have his hands, uh, you know, full, but Buck loves to have his hands full. Great move by the Mets. I agree with you now. And now Glendon, you know, you've played for a, a number of managers. So, I mean, we, what do you think a guy like Buck with his experience will bring to this team? I mean, his impact on the players and, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, he needs to put a coaching staff together. So, you know, I mean, just, but as, as a former player, you know, bringing in a guy with that kind of experience, you know, like what would your mindset be? Well, the first thing I think of is, is when he walks into spring training for the meeting the first day and he demands immediate respect, right? He's a long tenured manager, very knowledgeable, as good as it gets. So everyone in that clubhouse from the youngsters to the veterans are going to give him their immediate respect. And, and that's a huge part of it. I think, you know, to hold a team together, 25, 26 guys all year long, and then with all the moves you make, um, to have everybody bought in and, and be a part of uh, pulling, and, pulling the rope in the same direction, so to speak, uh, is a huge part of it. And I, and I do have some experience with Buck. In 2004, I was, I was a Rangers uh, spring training, uh, non-roster invitee. And uh, had a whole spring training with Buck. And I actually didn't make the roster and went to the Cubs. But uh, as Kevin was saying, he's as prepared and as organized. And that camp was run as well as any camp that I've ever been a part of. And I actually really, really liked Buck. And unfortunately, I never got to play for him during the regular season. It just didn't work out that way. But uh, I think it's a great pick for the Mets. I think Mets fans are going to be happy. And, and look, I've, I think the one thing that that everyone looks forward to is is seeing them get back to playoff baseball. And I think this this year they'll have an opportunity to do that for sure. I agree. And I mean, getting to what Glendon said, Rocco, you are a Mets fan. My one question to you, are you happy? Yeah, I'm ecstatic. You know, at the start of this whole thing, my top two choices were were Buck and Ron Washington. Uh, Ron was never, you know, a candidate, it seemed, but, you know, couldn't be happier with Buck Showalter. Uh, I think just his attention to detail um and if we, if that does manifest itself in better fundamentals um that's good for games in the standings we sit here just about every day and see how bad the base running is around the league how many mental errors there are uh, how much mismanagement um if buck could get that all in line that's going to translate to games in the standings and i'm uh and you know a better brand of baseball so i'm excited about that and um yeah couldn't be happier with the, the way the off season's going. Still think there's some work to do, but uh, excited for Mets baseball around Christmas time. Yeah, it's a great feeling. Excellent. And now, you know, it's funny, you mentioned fundamentals and we had spoken before we started about um, a coaching staff needing to be put together. And Howie, you had mentioned that, you know, pretty much everybody aside from the pitching coach mm -hmm. needs to be filled in. Do you think Buck is going to have a say in that, or do you? I mean, is he going to be able to bring in experienced baseball guys? He better, <laughs> you know. For one thing, <laughs> you don't get through the interview process and ultimately get the job without things like this having been on the table and largely discussed. And perhaps they've already vetted several candidates at Buck's behest who might become part of that coaching staff. But I think anytime you hire a manager, Buck, a manager of Buck's pedigree. You have to give him certain latitude as far as 
the hiring of coaches is concerned. And, you know, there are a couple who he's familiar with, whether Brian Butterfield or Wayne Kirby, who uh, are, are now effectively free agents as coaches who might factor in. But I think Buck's going to have and should have an awful lot to do with this. It's a collaborative process, to be sure. And, of course, Billy Epler is going to have significant input. But I think they've probably hammered some of this out already. That's interesting. That's interesting. Kevin, I was just curious on your thoughts about a coaching staff, because I know you're always uh, kind of in the know with. Yeah, he said years. He said years. He's got his coaching staff. I guarantee you. And, uh, and like how he said that that was probably a big discussion when he was uh, getting interviewed. That staff is out there. But here's the great part for Mets fans. There's so many good coaches that have been let go. And the nerds don't know what they had in these quality, quality coaches. So, so actually, I actually disagree with all the other writers and people who have been saying, oh, it's too late. It's going to be tough. It's going to never been easier to put together a good coaching staff because they're out there. They're not getting hired anymore. And they want to work for Buck. This is like, you know, this is like uh, when, in World War II when, uh, you, you know, the big generals had to decide we don't really like uh, General Patton, but, you know, we need him back to uh, – you know, take over the tank forces and, and, and get into Germany. So, so Buck is General Patton, and now he can, he can put all his people in charge. And I think it'll be, uh, it's going to be such a pleasure. And again, Howie's there every day, so I always defer to him. But Howie works hard. He's on the field like I was all the time when I was there. He's in the clubhouse, and he's watching things. So now he'll be able to watch things. Like I used to love to go to spring training in Sarasota when Buck did the uh, Orioles and, and I had the Yankees and the Yankees would play the Orioles. I would go over early just so I could watch Buck's team take infield outfield before a spring training game. This is going to be a whole new world for the Mets. They're actually going to work, you know, so it's going to be, it's going to be great. And he's going to have people like Butterfield, who's one of the best great guy too. And these, the, the other, the other plus is, especially for the uh, Mets fans and guys like Howie again, but Howie will be able to talk to these coaches because Buck <laughs> won't be too, too paranoid about it. And Howie will know more information now, kind of like the NFL guys when they sit down with the coaches and the quarterbacks, instead of the, the Mets over the past 10 years, whatever, five years, it's a new stadium. They keep their coaches closer to the way. You had to, you had to run into them, but now we'll have guys in charge. I would, here's what I would love to see. I don't think it'll happen, but it'd be kind of funny if Buck hired Chili Davis as the hitting coach. But, uh, <laughs> but, but he, I guarantee you he's got a list of guys. I don't have them with me right you know, off the top of my head, but they're going to be good coaches. They're going to care about the game. They're going to care about Buck. They're going to care about the players. And the Mets are finally going to have a complete uh, coaching staff. And if I could jump in real quickly, just to piggyback on something Kevin said about Buck's availability, it'll give me, and I mean, I'm almost 68 years old, but, but Buck forgot more about baseball when he went to sleep last night than I'll ever know. So the opportunity to learn the game on another level from Buck is going to be something that's been, you know, missing the last few years. And I, I just, you know, Bobby V was like that. Glendon knows that. I just, I just love talking to these Baseball lifers, Terry Collins was the same way. You just absorb and learn so much when you're around them. And I can't wait to have that experience. Uh, I, I can't blame you. And I mean, so on top of that, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the signings that they made this offseason because you're going to get to call these games with, you know, I mean, Max Scherzer and Jacob DeGrom. Is that the best one-two punch in baseball? Glendon as a pitcher, you know, what's your thought on that? I mean, if those two guys are coming at you, well, that's a lot of wins. I, I love the Scherzer signing because not, not only does it create a one-two punch of as good of top end of the rotation as there is in baseball, but you bring a you bring a presence, you bring an immediate veteran presence that that everyone else is gonna is gonna be around, learn from. Um, from afar, I think Degrom is a is a little more of a laid back, quiet guy, not necessarily as vocal maybe of a leader as as Scherzer might be. I could be wrong on that. I'm not in the clubhouse every day. But I, I love that signing. And, it, and the other, you know, interesting part about it was I highly doubt the Mets was maybe in Max's top three to five choices when, when the offseason started. So the fact that they really came after him and made him a priority, I think is awesome. And I look forward to watching him be there. 40 million was in his top three, though, I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that doesn't hurt. That's a good that point. Absolutely doesn't hurt. That doesn't yeah. that, I mean, well, Kevin, you know DeGrom pretty well. Um, do you think, you know, having Scherzer there now is going to make 
him even better if that's at all humanly possible. I mean, like, will there be a healthy competition between the two? Like, just what do you see happening there? Healthy competition. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when Syndergaard was at his best, and it looked to be it was going to be like a Degrom Syndergaard uh, one-two punch. I went up to Jake one day and said, "Hey, I got a good nickname for you two guys." And he goes, "Oh yeah, what do you got?" Because Jake loves the, the byplay and stuff like that, but he also loves to go after you. So I said, "My nickname for the one-two punch you guys are going to deliver is going to be uh, Syndergaard." which sounds kind of fun, you know, it's not, not the greatest thing in the world, not my greatest line, but it, it gets me through another day of spring training. He looked at me very sternly and said, no, his name's not first. So that tells you where Jake DeGrom is and how he'll be challenged by Scherzer. And Scherzer is kind of like, to me, he's kind of like a, an Aaron Rodgers type, you know, uh, uh, you know, he sees the game from so many different angles, works so hard. And let's not forget too, he's, a, he's an analytic kind of guy, you know, he has his, he has all the machines, has had them for years when he works out. So this will be good for DeGrom because it'll challenge him. And here's, here's the one negative, and I want to bring it up, Met fans, because, uh, you know, you're a Met fan. You know what life is like. You know, DeGrom could opt out after this year. What happens if DeGrom opts out and goes to Atlanta to be closer to home, and then all of a sudden at least the Mets have Scherzer now to fall back on? So, but I think he could love being with Scherzer, and all of a sudden, maybe he doesn't opt out. So, so there's a lot, lot of play here, a lot to look forward to. I agree. And before I get back to Howie about this, Rocco, once again, you are the Met fan. Um, you know what? You're seeing this now. When was the last time you saw a top of the rotation like this? I mean, the the potential was there. I mean, now Syndergaard wasn't this as accomplished as as Scherzer is. Um, you know, the Mets has always, have always had good pitching. Uh, you know, the top two is, is you know, you're talking two probable Hall of Famers. I don't like putting people in the Hall of Fame, you know, ahead of time, but you're talking talking with that. The Mets have never had that. Um, you know, it's been a long time, and, and it's, it's going to be great to watch them. You know, you go into a three-game series with the two of them pitching, and if they're allowed to, which I think they will under Buck, if they're allowed to pitch seven innings, that's 14 out of, you know, 14 out of the eight innings where you're getting Hall of Famers on the mound, uh, followed by, you know, Diaz and hopefully somebody pretty good there. So it's giving yourself a chance to win, you know, all those series where they pitch like that. Um, you know, I, as a typical Mets fan, I love it, uh, but I'm also worried about positions three, four, and five in the rotation, uh, you know, and, and don't want to get too, too rosy just yet. That's, no, that's a great point. Now, Howie, I mean, um, I was going to ask you actually – about that, what Rocco had just said. I mean, what do you see in the the rest of that rotation? Are the Mets done making moves, or do you think they're just going to go in house? Well, I'll tell you what what intrigues me, and, and I they need to go way beyond what's in house, in, in my opinion. There's not enough depth there, period. And when you've got the questions about, and you have to objectively list Jacob Degrom among the physical question marks based on what happened last year. Now, there's no question this team needs more pitching depth. So as adamantly as they have uh, tried to hold on to their best minor league prospects, there's an intriguing guy out there who apparently is very much available, and that's uh, Luis Castillo with the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, this kid's got a great arm. He learned the change up from the master of that craft, Mario Soto, in the Reds organization. And, you know, even though he had a bit of a rough year last year, to be sure, um, he's potentially a gem. He's 29 years old, and he would be a great fit. Now, they'd have to give up something significant. The one guy who I believe is completely off the table and should be is Francisco Alvarez, because, you know, 20-year-old catchers who have the kind of offensive potential that he has um, are not readily available, nor do they pop up very often. So, you know, they're not, they're not moving him, but you know, with Lindor set for 10 years at shortstop and Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos on the way, potentially at third, Ronnie Mauricio is a guy who is highly regarded among baseball scouts who might be a valuable trade chip. And I can see them making him a big part of a potential deal with the Reds if they want to bring in a guy like Luis Castillo, because, you know, again, to sum up, I think they're short on pitching depth and Castillo would be a great get. That's, I mean, Castillo, I believe his second half was last year was just like, he kind of figured it out towards the end of the season. If, if I'm correct, Rocco will tell me if I'm wrong at the end, but um, no, he'd be a great fit for any team. Um, I agree with that. Now, you know, I would like, you know, just kind of go around and talk about, 
the other uh, free agents, I mean, you have two new outfielders there in Marte and Canna. Um, you know, I mean, Marte, I think, was a great move for them. I mean, I'd say, again, another guy I kind of wish the Yankees signed, but, you know, no such luck. And Canna is kind of an under-the-radar guy. I mean, it's, I've seen him out here a lot on the West Coast. He can hit. Um, you know, uh, Kevin, what do you think about these two? Well, Marte, um, again, they overpay, but that's okay because uh, you got to overpay. Marte, they need an athletic uh, outfielder. I'm a little concerned about right field, if no Conforto, obviously, if, if uh, we, who knows what's going to happen there. Uh, I don't know if Canna can play right field. They're saying he could. I don't think he's, uh, you know, I think that's a big question mark. He's also the kind of player, which is kind of interesting. He's, he's the kind of guy where's the big elbow guard, and um, he'll stick his elbow out there. So he, re- I'm sure Glendon Rush would have loved that. Um, because, uh, you know, I've seen, uh, videos of him and, uh, uh, and I've watched him through the years. He, he could irritate the opposition. So he could bring that too a little bit, you know, which the Mets don't have. Everybody wants to be nice to everybody, you know, instead of trying to kick somebody's butt. So that, that's interesting as well. Uh, Marte, I loved on a lot of different levels. He can steal bases again, gets back to what Buck does, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying he's Adam Jones, but, you know, Adam Jones was a good outfielder in that respect. And, uh, and Marte maybe could play that role. And here's the other thing about Buck, too. He will take those veterans. They will run the clubhouse. He will tell them, you know, don't I don't want to catch you, uh, you know, not hustling. I want you to tell these other guys. So to me, we haven't even talked about it, but what's going to go on with Robinson Cano? You know, how does Cano fit? If there's a DH, you know, there's so much to go on there. But if the first time Cano, and, and, and Robbie has done this his whole career, basically, since he pulled a ham, uh, a, a thigh muscle, uh, um, he doesn't run the first. So, you know, that's just another little thing. So there's so many layers, but that's the great thing about it. You know, and that's the thing we're going to talk about. And, and again, uh, you know, I'm sure the announcers and the writers love this. Buck will bring baseball back into the subject of the, of the Mets, you know, we'll be talking baseball things instead of spin rate. I heard a great line from, uh, from a, a pitching coach, a college pitching coach, uh, the other day, he said at, at university of Arizona, and he said, you know what? Uh, nobody cares about the speed of ball four. You know what? Nobody cares about the 58 foot slider and the, and the spin and the rotation, the spin rotation on throw strikes, you know? So, so that's what we're going to get back to. We're going to get back to baseball talk. And, the, and, and we're also going to get back to, isn't it interesting that the Mets could take over New York in many ways now and doing it with one of the Yankees' former guys who's kind of set up the big run. Buck set up that big run with Gene Michael and some other people because he, he knew the talent, the young talent. And uh, I'm sure he's, one of the things he's doing right now is checking out all that minor league talent. And like how he said, I saw Alvarez play a couple of times this year and, uh, you know, I, I, um, I saw him play a couple times this year and I was impressed with him. He's got a great bat and uh, uh, we'll see where it goes, but they have some talent. They have uh, some fun and uh, they have some baseball questions to be answered. I agree. And now Howie, I mean, you know, one guy we didn't talk about was Eduardo Escobar, who everybody is saying, you know, I mean, everybody wants to play with uh, everyone says he's one of their favorite clubhouse guys. I don't honestly know a whole lot about him, uh, but how do you think he's going to impact the clubhouse with these guys like Marte and Canada? Do you think that's going to bring a little more, like Kevin just said, uh, you know, I mean, are they going to kind of provide a little more veteran presence like with Buck at the helm? Well, I like him right away because I understand that he's a big Brazilian steakhouse fan. So right away, he gets some points in my book. Absolutely. Um, keep that card on green, boys. You'll never be hungry. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, the other thing about Escobar, is that, and, and this is by design, you know, this isn't just a, a sort of coincidental number of things falling into a certain place without having been preordained, if you will. He's also considered a terrific clubhouse guy and one who preaches and delivers as well accountability. That clubhouse last year had problems and mm-hmm with a Max Scherzer, maybe even an Escobar or Marte, but had those guys been around last year, I don't think you would have seen some of the nonsense you did between the ridiculous explanation of the Lindor-McNeil altercation or, and I keep coming back to this 
one word, and I know a lot of people have challenged me on it, but I'm sorry. That thumbs down thing to the fans, you might as well have given them this rather than this, because that's, <laughs> that, it was the same thing. It was reprehensible. And it was allowed not only to happen, but to fester. It wasn't a spontaneous thing. They talk about it. Nobody stepped in and said, this is a bad idea. That won't happen next year, largely because of the people that they brought on, apart from simply Buck Showalter. Any discussion of the Mets this year has to revolve in part around uh, an enhanced clubhouse atmosphere and also climate of accountability, something that's been largely lacking for too long. Um, uh, Glendon, you know, I mean, talking about just like what Howie was saying, you know, accountability. I mean, like, you know, I mean, these guys coming in, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about that? And how does that help a team from the clubhouse if there is accountability being preached as opposed to just, you know, kind of like a, just a free for all. It's going to start with Buck and then it's, and then it's going to trickle down to the guys um, that were already there and the guys that they brought in. And, and that will, that relationship, I think will all develop during spring training is when you'll see uh, everyone kind of come together and figure out, all right, who's our, who's our clubhouse leaders, who's the vocal guys, who's the lead by example guys, and it all comes together. And there's another part that I think is really interesting, and I think we talked about it maybe on one of our previous shows that we did, is that I think, like it or not, some of the guys don't love it, but the media needs to be back in the clubhouse, and the announcers need to be back in the clubhouse, and everything else, because that also provides a form of accountability of what goes on, um, they don't need to be in there 24 seven. And I know all players don't necessarily love that, but there is part of that that I think provides um, kind of everyone knowing what's going on, seeing what's going on, talking to guys, developing relationships, developing trust. So I can sit down with Howie and we can talk about one of my starts and I can say some stuff that I'm not worried. He's going to, you know, go say to somebody else. And then I'm, I'm, you know, upset about that. And it creates a riff as opposed to developing good relationships to, we're all working together. We all want the same goal. The, the, the writers, the, the announcers, the radio guys, the TV guys, all the way up to the front office, everybody's goal is the same. They want to go to the playoffs and win a World Series, right? So I think, I think when players understand that and take accountability for their actions, I think it all, it all goes together. I'm going to have to piggyback off of that and ask Kevin and Howie. I mean, do you think, do you see that happening uh, where, where you guys are let back in the clubhouse or are we in a brave new world where everything is just done like this? It's a great question. And I'm not sure that the, whenever it's done, new CBA will have addressed that. It might well be left up to the individual clubs. And I hope that, in fact, there is some sort of stipulation or agreement, whether it's actually within the text of a CBA or not, that we, meaning the media, broadcasters and, and uh, writers, have got to be back in there. And Glendon hit on the most important word in the entire equation, and that's trust. It's not because we need to be or want to be buddy buddy with these guys. I'm old enough to be their father, you know. So it's not it's not about building relationships that develop beyond the clubhouse necessarily. It's about you know gathering pertinent information that make for a more entertaining and informative broadcast. But at the same time, to go back to what Glendon said about trust, it, it allows that bond to develop where he can tell me something or any player can tell me something about his game or a specific incident within a game that just enhances our ability to basically relate what the situation is around the club at any given time. You have to have that. And, um, and I just hope it comes back. Yeah. And, Kevin, yeah. Kevin, same yeah, question. Yeah. For the most part, uh, the players liked through the years, they love talking to me because I would ask pretty good questions. I'd be curious. And also they don't understand that we're kind of like a, we're like a steam valve. You can talk to a, a reporter that you trust about what's going on and get that out so it's not festering. And before you know it, a, a bad situation isn't as bad as it once was. And it, it, all those things that happened with the Mets last year, part of that reason was because they weren't in the clubhouse, you know? And, and when you start letting the inmates run the asylum, it's the old story, it's a problem. And my, my, my fear is the the, first of all, the writers have to be adamant about this. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a new, the, the new elephants are in the room, so to speak, uh, you know, so they have to handle this, but they will, the players, most players now 
don't want us in the clubhouse. I, I would honestly say that that's how they feel because they don't realize how to basically work a relationship and make it work for them. Uh, if they get that opportunity, and, and I'm not defending all writers. There's some writers too that, you know, will, will you know, I, I won't mention a name, but there was once a story uh, with Tim Flannery. I'm in the clubhouse and Flannery, who was one of the nicest guys of all time with the Padres, comes in screaming at a, another writer. And, um, and, and he said, and he mentioned a guy by name, said, hey, what, 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 what was that all about? That was off the record. And, and the writer said, Plan, sorry, it was just too good to use, to not use. So, so, so this is a two-way street. You know, you got to earn respect, uh, but it's part of the game. And it's actually more dangerous. The players have to understand this too. It's more dangerous that they don't communicate with the media because then they can't get their word out. And uh, I think uh, they can't explain situations and then media is just going to write with, you know, whatever information they have, wherever it comes from. So it's not, I know we live in a Twitter world, but Twitter world doesn't work for media relations. And that to me should be a big question uh, in the CBA to get the writers and the, and the broadcasters back. And again, with the Mets, that's why Mets fans are lucky. You know, um, you know, Howie's always in the clubhouse. Gary's in there. You know, Keith here and there. You know, uh, Ronnie's always down there. But Keith is in his own world, and that's why we love him. Uh, but when he gets a chance to talk to the players, you know, he'll do BP a lot. And that all comes back to the fan. The fan gets more information. So why wouldn't you want that? So that's the way it's got to be uh, moving forward. We'll see what happens. I remember the broadcasters used to travel with the team. And yes. that adds a whole different dimension to the amount of trust that you build and information that you accrue over a course of a season. All right, that's... that's Um, before we run out of time, I would like to go around and get a final thought from each of you about, um, you know, what's going to go on in Queens this year and what you see happening. And uh, I'll start with Rocco because we haven't heard from you in a minute. Thanks. Uh, I'll just, you know, start with something that Howie's been addressing on Twitter. And that's the uh, idea we haven't talked about it, but Buck with analytics. Uh, and it was uh, something that stuck in my mind. Uh, I interviewed Billy Martin Jr. And I asked him the question, what, what he thought that his father would have done with analytics. And I was expecting him to answer one way. Uh, Billy Martin Jr. said, my dad would have loved analytics. He was so competitive. He would look for any advantage he would possibly get. And, but he would take those analytics and use them the right way. Uh, you know, he wouldn't let that dictate if he knew something was going to be right. So I'm looking for Buck to do that. How he's talked about that. I think he'll embrace the analytics, um, use them to his advantage and not overuse them and not, not be a puppet to them. All right. uh, Howie, I'll go to you. Yeah, well, for one thing, and I've said this on Twitter and anywhere else I've been interviewed recently, is that I think it's absolutely insulting to suggest that Buck Showalter or any other manager of that approximate age range would be reluctant to embrace and digest however much information is presented to him to potentially give him an edge. The difference is that a manager needs to have the, really to reserve the right to make the in-game decisions based on the instincts that have been derived from watching that game since the earliest memories of, of those managers. And I'll go back to a, a, a situation real quickly that developed in a Mets game last year. They're playing the Marlins. There was one guy in that Marlins lineup that could potentially have beaten him in that particular game kid named Dela Cruz, who had been wearing them out. And a situation evolved late in the game. I forget if it was tied or if the Mets were a run ahead or whatever it was. It was the key at bat in the game. And the Mets had a chance, or a choice more accurately, to put Dela Cruz on and pitch to the guy on deck who literally was hitting about a buck 40 or for whatever ridiculous reason go after Dela Cruz. And after the game, after Dela Cruz got the hit to beat them, Luis Rojas said a whole number of different things about any different series of metrics telling him that it was okay to pitch to Dela Cruz between the strengths of the particular pitcher on the mound at, at that time and the perceived weaknesses of Dela Cruz. I, I didn't believe for a second that 
with Luis Rojas having grown up in one of baseball's royal families, and again, having probably forgotten more about the game than I'll never know, willingly chose to pitch to De La Cruz in that situation. There was absolutely no logic that told you, pitch to this guy. They did. It burned them. And I think that was um, a probably forced uh, attention to whatever those metrics suggested at that time that overrided the instincts that I think Buck Showalter will make sure to use as the priority. I agree. Kevin, this is right in your wheelhouse, so I have to go to you next. Yeah, there's a lot of things, but a couple of little things. The Mets have had too many people, both pitchers and players have told me this. There's been too many people in their ear talking. In other words, Hefner's there, there's an assistant pitching coach, there's a pitching coordinator. They're giving them too much information, as crazy as that sounds. Buck will uh, clean up the voices. Uh, Conforto, another one. You could see Conforto was confused last year. He had different hitting coaches. So Buck will get rid of all the voices that shouldn't be heard and you only listen to the voices that should be heard. And the second thing is the Mets and baseball better settle this thing quickly because the be the longer spring training is for the Mets, the better they'll be because Buck will have the time to, to implement his game. And, and the players will be amazed by this. And, and the most important thing, and I alluded to my first comment, but Buck will have to win over Lindor in a way to make Lindor play like Terry Francona had Lindor playing. And I think that's a big plus. I think he, I think Lindor will respect Buck immediately. And I think Lindor will clean up his head too. That's what we're getting a lot. Basic, basically, we need, we need basically the rotor rooter to come into the Mets and clean up all the garbage. Some of the garbage is out, but there's still a lot of garbage there. And Buck will be, and as Buck gets deeper into this, this to me is the most interesting thing. As Buck gets deeper into this, He's going to run into some people, and I'm not going to name names, but there's people I know who are just so power hungry within that Met organization that they're going to try to take credit for things. Buck will have to spot who these people are and X them out as quickly as possible. All right, Glendon, let me get a final thought from you on what's going to happen in Queens before we go to Rocco. If you look every year, the team that wins the World Series or even the two teams that get to the World Series, there's always a... Uh, a comfortable blend between analytics, baseball knowledge, uh, a wealth of knowledge on the bench with with uh, the coaching staff and usually the pitching guys. And as games unfold, the same traits win games down the stretch every single year. And it has been that way for forever, right? It's It's good pitching, defense, timely hitting, moving runners when you need to all that, all those things that we, that we love to watch as baseball fans and guys that have been around it. So I think nothing in that respect is going to change. And that, that leads me to the point of Buck being a perfect guy to come in there and, and blend that all together from a leadership standpoint. And uh, I'm looking forward to the season. Well, that brings us to Rocco Constantino, our ombudsman. I think everyone was pretty on point today. If anybody screwed anything up, it was probably me, but he's going to let us know right now. Uh, Rocco, go for it, my friend. All right, got some things to add here. Uh, Glendon, in the beginning, kind of humbly, as always, mentioned his six wins with the Cubs. That was, uh, I think, 2004. It went 6-2, and 3.47 ERA, and that's on in 16 starts in a rotation with Kerry White. That's 10 million now, brother. Seriously. <laughs> Mark Pryor, Greg Maddox, all those guys, and he hit two homers this year, that year. Uh, wow. Awesome stuff. Um, General Patton was 59 years old when he led the troops across the Rhine into Germany. Uh, Buck Showalter, 65. So General Patton, younger than Buck, uh, as Buck takes over the Mets here. Uh, Mr. Kernan coined the phrase Cindergram, March 16th, 2018, on Twitter. <laughs> When he said Cindergram is ready to go, and then referenced it in an article again on April Fool's Day, 2018, uh, and then uh, couldn't find anything after that. Perfect. Uh, Castillo, sec second half of the year, five and six, 3.42 ERA, but he pitched into the seventh inning in five of 13 starts, which incredibly now is pretty impressive. Uh, so he can give the Mets a lot of innings there, I think. Uh, also, Brian De La Cruz was batting 410. Over his previously twelve previous twelve games in that reference, uh, and they pitched to him instead of walking him and going after the immortal 
Lewin Diaz, who was four for 40 on the season. So, sound strategy. strategy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sound strategy that's indeed. <laughs> and, hey, and that's what happens when you get rid of advanced scouts too, by the way. Sure. And you do all your scouting by TV. Absolutely. But they like the slider against De La Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, that's gentlemen. That's all I got. That's great. Thank you, Rocco. And uh, I want to go around and thank everybody for uh, coming on today. This was a blast. Um, you have – My Willie. You have – You have them too. Louis Armstrong too. Yeah, there you <laughs> mine, go. My, mine's in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to – He does look like Louis Armstrong. All right. But I want to go around and say thank you to everybody. Howie Rose, thanks for coming on. Uh, you got it. pleasure. Thank you so Enjoyed much. Enjoyed it. Uh, Glendon, thank you. As usual, always a, always a pleasure. Anytime, Thank you. come on back. Rocco, Kevin, it's always, always a pleasure with you guys. Uh, thank you guys so much. And, um, you know, let's hope we get the CBA settled soon and get back to baseball and uh, get back to some hot stove action because there's nothing I hate more than a cold stove. So, guys, I want to say thank you. Appreciate it. And I'm Chris Vitale, and we will see you next time on the Ball Nine Round. 